let's finish it. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of The Closing Pitch. My name is Spike Helms, and this is a show about people, culture, and how to create a winning lifestyle. We are actually doing this remotely. Dave is back in St. Louis. I'm in California, um, and we have a special guest today. Um, we promised that we'd bring him on, and Ben has um, been more than uh, willing to come on and um, speak about specialization. Um, and I think this is going to be a very unique uh, conversation. I'm excited about it because he did get a huge storm of people uh, talking at him and tweeting at him about this various topic. Um, so without further ado, Ben, go ahead and introduce yourself. Um, go ahead and throw in um, Tread Athletics. How did you get started um, and where where has it been going? Sure. So I'll just give the kind of the, the five minute version here. Um, so I started off uh, as a high school kid who never really uh, considered if I wanted to play at the next level. Uh, I was throwing 70 to 73 as a freshman and sophomore in high school, I was 6'3", a buck 50. And I went to kind of a small, a small private school where development really wasn't a priority. I wasn't around talented players, um, but something clicked my, my summer after my freshman year um, where I realized like for the first time in my life, like, hey, I'm actually not one of the better players on the field. Um, I better, better decide if I want to do something about this. And so for whatever reason, something clicked that, that one summer before my sophomore year of high school. And I said, like, I'm going to devote, you know, I'm going to devote myself to my baseball career. I'm going to do everything I possibly can to, to play in college and perhaps beyond. And I, the, the question I just couldn't, I couldn't answer was, you know, why shouldn't I be able to throw 90 plus miles an hour if thousands of other people could do it? Um, I couldn't answer that question. So in my mind, that meant, well, it must be possible, right? Like, I just need to create my body to to be able to produce that level of force in that amount of time, uh, put my body in the same positions and same timing that they could do. Um, and so I kind of looked at it as like this, this physics and math problem. Like if I can just figure out what I don't know to get my body to, to perform and move that way, well, why can't I do it if they can do it? And so that kind of started this relentless pursuit of learning everything I could. Obviously, you know, we're talking about 15 years ago, there weren't nearly as many resources out there today. Velocity training wasn't really a well-known thing. No one threw weighted balls. Um, you know, it was still pitchers doing distance running, uh, you know, for, for training and conditioning. Um, and so it, it was a time where there really wasn't as much readily accessible information as, as you guys no doubt remember. Like I was reading uh, Tough Cuff by Stephen Ellis. That was like the only book that was out at the time. I don't know if you guys remember yep. that. Yep. And so I you know, buy that, follow it, um, read every nutrition article I could get my hands on. Um, and really it was just a, a learning process for me. Uh, I was following like powerlifting programs and I'd follow some bodybuilding program and I would try some bodybuilding nutrition plan and um, doing everything I could to, to try to improve, try to get better. But I just, I honestly just didn't know what I didn't know at the time. And so, uh, you know, fast forward to senior year, uh, you know, end up throwing mid eighties, uh, end up walking on at university of Maryland. I was immediately the worst player on the team, my freshman year at Maryland and, you know, kind of the process restarted again, having to claw my way up. Um, you know, wasn't a guy who really got any innings until my senior year of college. Uh, by then I was a low to mid nineties guy. I'm a sidearm lefty. Uh, and so that started to finally get some, some notice. I got started to actually get some playing time, uh, get some results, ended up getting drafted by the Chicago white Sox. Uh, and so, you know, that that process uh, I documented online, actually, at uh, one of Stephen Ellis's uh, pitching forums. It's called uh, Let's Talk Pitching dot com. I don't know if you guys remember. It was one of the mm -hmm. only like pitching related forums that, that existed 12, 15 years ago. Um, and so I was in my first year of professional baseball with the White Sox and uh, my current business partner and I were kind of having this conversation because people saw that I'd been drafted. They kind of had been following the story uh, that I was documenting online and you know, a lot of people started reaching out saying, hey, can you write a program for my son? Hey, can you look at my son's mechanics and tell me what he needs to do to get better? Hey, can you uh, give me some nutrition tips? I saw you gain 60 pounds. Like, how did you do it? Uh, and so we started getting a lot of these questions. Um, funny enough, uh, you guys definitely know who Pitching Ninja is. Uh, oh, yeah. He was yeah. our second ever remote athlete. Um, and so Rob had been following that, that pitching log for, I don't even know, eight to 10 years. And so he reached out and Jack was one of the first athletes that we worked with. Um, and so it became this thing where I was still pursuing my own career in the minor leagues. Uh, my business partner, he, he was retired. He pitched at Clemson. And so 
you know, we were basically spending every every waking moment that, you know, I wasn't at the field uh, and pretty much every waking moment of his trying to figure out, like, how do we get players better remotely? How do we, how, how can we do this? Because, you know, we didn't have a facility at the time. Like, we were starting from absolute ground zero. Like, we had three clients, but we knew we knew how to get players better. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he was self-trained to low to mid-90s as a lefty. Same for me. Um, we never had the coaching. We never had the resources. Um, but we knew that we had some information. We knew that we could guide guys how to gain weight, how to get stronger, uh, how to intelligently apply the weighted ball training, the long toss, uh, the different velocity type drills, uh, the plyo care balls, all these different tools. Um, we saw a lot of cookie cutter programs out there that weren't individualized towards certain athletes. And so we started just putting the puzzle pieces together, learning, uh, tinkering, creating systems around like, okay, what does this look like if we ever train 100 athletes at a time? What does this look like if we train 1,000 athletes? What does this look like when we train 5,000 athletes? And trying to build it around that vision and that, that model. Um, so fast forward to today, uh, we now have 32 uh, members of Tread Athletics, which is the name of the, their company. We have 20 of those are, are full-time coaches. We train, uh, don't need to get into the exact numbers, but we've trained thousands of athletes now uh, since we were founded in 20, 2015. Uh, and we now have a 33,000 square foot facility in Charlotte, North Carolina. And so again, it started as, you know, trying to figure it out in like this isolated case, my own career um, and everything I would learn, every injury, every mistake, um, trying to apply that to make sure that athletes wouldn't make the same mistakes, right? Every time I overdid it and, uh, you know, tweak my back doing something stupid in the weight room or tweak my arm because I was doing like max effort dry reps and I was like, didn't realize that there's still stress on your arm when you're doing a dry rep. Like all these little mistakes, like thousands of them, um, trying to weave those into our programs, weave those into our coaching philosophy. And so now we're in this really cool scenario where, like I said, 20, 20 full-time coaches, uh, 32 total members, support staff, uh, et cetera. Um, we're all learning from each other on a daily basis. And so we're all here in Charlotte in the same facility, um, you know, training hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of athletes and learning at this incredibly rapid rate and then presenting what we've learned to each other and constantly iterating and refining our philosophy. Uh, and so I think that's where it's at. It's, it's no longer about my own philosophy. It's I have a ton of smart people around me and each of them is smarter than me in their one little piece of ex one little area of expertise. So I'm learning from them. They're learning from me and we're all learning from each other collectively. And so that creates a pretty a pretty dangerous entity uh, for the baseball industry now that we uh, we've gotten to this point because it's only accelerating from here. So you're willing to be wrong, like you guys are willing to admit, like, okay, I was actually wrong in this scenario. Um, now that we have backed evidence on this specific movement, for sure. And that that's the only way you learn, right? You don't learn if you if you just think you're right all the time, or right? you actually you learn when you stop talking and when you when you listen, uh, and when you make mistakes, and that forces you to actually. Uh, kind of internalize that and, and question like, uh, like this happens on Twitter, I would say maybe a handful of times a year where like someone calls me out on something that I said, and they actually bring up a legitimate, a legitimate point. Like it's not just a troll, but it's like a legitimate yeah. point. <laughs> I'm like, wait a second, like they have a point there. And then I have to think and, and kind of reflect and like dig through my own philosophy and my own, my own thinking. And that's, that's how I learned to evolve. Like there's a number of light bulb moments a year where it doesn't have to be on Twitter, but someone really calls into question something that I thought I knew. I thought I had a good rationale and I, I welcome people poking holes in, you know, anything I say, anything I put out there. And so obviously we're going to talk about the, the tweet today. Um, yep. But my justification there was like, I've heard a lot of rationale for, um, you know, for and against specialization, but I, I just hadn't heard that one argument that really convinced me uh, that athletes needed to be playing three sports in high school when they knew for sure beyond a shadow of doubt, which sport they wanted to play at the next level. And so I was like, let's hear your arguments. Like I haven't, I haven't heard one that convinced me. Yep. I, I think that's super important to not be dogmatic in your beliefs and always being willing to open your mind to um, different thoughts and ideas. And that, and it segues really well into your tweet, which uh, to remind everybody on it, um, Ben tweeted, um, on November 18th, if you are in high school and know you want to play baseball in college, I can think of ex exactly zero convincing arguments to be playing two to three other sports year round. Can we stop pretending that practicing basketball makes you better at pitching? Um, dive into what your thoughts were. I know you're smiling yep. on it. Um, Obviously, the phrasing of like the, that specific tweet, but tw uh, Twitter in general can be like a little bit combative because you're you're constrained to like 
whatever it is now, 240 characters. Yeah. Um, so obviously there's areas of gray and that's where, you know, that's why you reached out and I wanted to have this conversation uh, and explain like, look, I'm not saying that there is no value to playing other sports. There is value. Um, certainly when it comes to building an athletic base, uh, a base of athleticism, there's a huge place for that. I would argue every, every kid needs to build an athletic base. And that one of the main ways you do that is through exploring uh, varied movements. And how do you do that? Well, you do that by playing a bunch of different sports. Um, I, I started writing a blog post, so I actually have like a paragraph here I can read out. Um, just kind yeah. of giving some context to that tweet. Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll just Definitely. read that. Go for it. Kick the conversation off that way. Um, so I said uh, a big reason this topic seemed to upset so many people uh, appears to be the lack of context, uh, i.e. not understanding who I'm actually talking to. Uh, what I'm not saying is that all high school baseball players should just quit every other sport. I'm not advocating that youth athletes should either. There definitely is value to playing other sports, as we'll get into below. There are also quite a few drawbacks, depending on the context. So who is this tweet actually referring to? There's a specific group of high school athletes. Let's call them the 1%. These aren't the majority of players who know they won't play in college. They should maximize their high school experience because this is where it ends for them. These also aren't the stud athletes who want to play in college just because baseball happens to be their best sport, but they equally value other sports as well. I'm talking to the players who want to uncover every bit of their potential within the sport of baseball and take it to the highest level possible for them. The 1% aren't optimizing for fun. The 1% aren't optimizing for a general base of athleticism, which they already acquired over the first decade and a half of their life by playing many sports. The 1% want to know what path will give them the highest chance to reach their baseball goals. When deciding whether or not to specialize, this is the group I'm talking to. And if you're enraged by my tweet, you probably aren't the 1%. <laughs> so if the above doesn't apply to you or your son, continue playing multiple sports. And if he's talented enough to play college baseball while training one third of the year for it, keep doing so. Not everyone's goal needs to be to squeeze out every single drop of baseball talent they can by age 18. However, this was my goal. And this is the goal of most of the athletes who seek us out for training. For most of them, they simply can't allocate the same level of time and resources to their baseball related limiting factors when they participate in competition of any type year round. And this includes year round baseball competition, which I'm not advocating for either. This type of extreme approach is necessary if peak performance is the athlete's goal, which is something every Olympic gymnast, swimmer, weightlifter, et cetera, figured out long ago. Is it psychologically healthy to pursue one endeavor above all others? Well, that's up for debate. We can discuss that. Um, what's not really up for debate is that becoming the absolute best version of yourself in a given sport requires an uncomfortable level of laser focus and thousands, if not tens of thousands of hours. Those who reach the best version of themselves and have the right genetics for it will become world-class over those tens of thousands of hours. Those without such gifted genetics still find themselves competing at a higher level than any of those around them once thought possible. So bottom line, um, I think the, Olymp the Olympic uh, comparison is, is appropriate here. Um, not everyone should go try to pursue a, a sport uh, at an Olympic caliber. Um, there's a ton of sacrifices associated with that. You're sacrificing, you know, relationships, you're sacrificing time with your family, you're sacrificing, um, you know, going to the movies on the weekend. Like there's a lot of stuff you're sacrificing. Um, so let's call it the 1% of people who have that level of drive to be the very best version of themselves in one endeavor. Like it could, we could be talking about like uh, guitar or piano or like musical instruments or anything that takes 10,000 plus hours, uh, whatever you get, understand the point, like to get really, really mm -hmm. good, to get world-class at one thing. It takes an uncomfortable level level of effort. Um, so given that, if you're a 16 year old kid who wants to play college baseball and you're not good enough, are you going to allocate as much focus as you can towards getting good enough? Or are you gonna do like four months out of the year and then just not think about it for the next eight months? It becomes an that opportunity. That was my point. It becomes opportunity yeah. cost, right? So whatever you choose to do, you're losing out on the other thing, whether that's um, you playing another sport or you being able to gain more velocity on your fastball and sure. um, actually focusing in on it. And it sounds like you're actually and talking it's, about your talking to yourself, like your younger self in that, in that so post. That's what exact, it seemed like. Yeah. So, so like T Tom House uh, had, had written a tweet the day before, which sparked me getting to think about it. And mm -hmm. he said that a lot of players they talk to regret not playing, like they regret not playing multiple sports in high school because uh, they regret they missed out on having fun or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, that wasn't my goal wasn't to have fun. My goal was to be the best version of myself I could possibly be in that one mm -hmm. thing. So I, I actually regret because I ran cross country for two years in high school and 
I didn't realize until like I was 17 that that was actually a competing adaptation to what I was trying to do. It was actually hurting my ability to throw harder, put on weight, become a better baseball pitcher. And basketball, very very similar scenario. You're training an aerobic system. Uh, we have athletes that we work with all the time. They're multi-sport high, uh, athletes in high school. And it's like, the kid throws 86, he wants to throw 90 to play at the school he wants to play at. And he, we know he needs to put on 25 pounds and he's running two hours a day in practice four months out of the year and he can't gain weight. The second the season ends, he starts putting on two pounds a week. And it's like, well, we're four months behind schedule. Like, what do you want to do? If you want to play basketball at the next level or you just want to have fun, no problem whatsoever. But the guys that we see, they tell us like, look, I have this one goal above all else. And so we just lay it out there. It's like, look, if you if that really is your goal, then we need to allocate our time and resources appropriately because you only have if it's a high school junior, like you only have one more year to, to mm -hmm. be focusing on this to get to this four or five, six mile an hour jump that you, you say you need, you say that you want. So what is it to do that? You're going to need to get to these metrics. Most likely you're going to need to put on 20, 25, 30 pounds. You're not going to be doing that in season. So you're going to be doing that in this very shortened uh, window of an off season. So really, realistically, we're talking about, you know, you need to be putting on a pound a week for pretty much every week of the off season from now till you graduate. Like, are you going to go run an hour and a half a day on those days? Like, you right. can do it, but now you need to eat 5,000 plus calories a day to do it. Like, you just made your life a lot harder. So it's not that there isn't value to playing basketball. Like, when you're younger, like, you're gaining this athleticism. My mm -hmm. point is, like, up until puberty, that's when you should be gaining this athletic base. You should be, you know, go do karate, parkour, basketball, soccer. Like, learn to move dynamically. But eventually there's a point and maybe that's 15 years old if someone's really motivated and just knows it at 15 and maybe they don't realize that and what their goal is until they're 17, maybe it's 18, but there's somewhere in that range. Whenever that athlete decides for themselves that that's what they want to do above all else, I think that's when they need to make the sacrifice uh, if that's their goal, and if they're the one. I've had that same conversation with a million players, Ben, and, and I think every single conversation is totally unique to that individual. But I've had that exact conversation with players just like you have to where I've kind of seen them go down that path and they play multiple sports, but they're really, really focused in baseball, but they're not making the gains they want. They have that drive. They have that want to get to the next level, but obviously haven't allocated enough time or put in enough effort to do so to warrant those those rewards. So what I guess because you've trained thousands of athletes like we have, how are there some like signs that you see with those athletes or how do you navigate those conversations? Cause obviously it's not a certain age point. It's not, it's not a certain skill level point. And none of those things I believe are the factors. They might be little tiny factors in making that decision. How do you help athletes that you work with navigate to get to that point where now you're going to put it all out in front of them and say, listen, you have all these goals, you have all these wants and, 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 but you have to simply allocate more time and put more effort into that specific sport training year round. How do you, how do you navigate that conversation? Yeah, it's a good question. I think you have to make it as objective as possible. You're really talking about getting the buy-in like it's a guy who loves, you know, might love basketball, love playing football equally to baseball, but like he happens to be a little bit better at baseball. And so like he happens to just be on the track of playing baseball in college because that, that's his best sport, but like he loves them all. So how do you actually get the buy-in? Um, I think you need to make it as objective as possible. Like, well, first off, it's it's tough because if you're having to convince him, he's probably not the 1%. He's probably not the guy. Correct. Like, if you need to pull him, dragging and kick him to the weight room and, you know, he's clearly just not following the nutrition plan you give him. It, like, then he, it's like, save your breath. He's not, he's not the guy that he, like, I'm not particularly good at motivating. Um, I don't pretend to be. I never had any problems with this intrinsic motivation myself. I just, like, I'm going to, I'm going to go out there on the field and like kill you. I'm going to do everything I can in the, in the way, like I'm just going to push myself and everything I do. I never had that problem. So I, I can't relate to someone who just like doesn't know what they want and just go after it. Um, I think if you have to motivate them to that extent, they're not the like, just don't waste your time. Um, sometimes they just need to see the, the objective numbers in front of them. So if you are going to take the effort to try to convince them, make it as objective as possible. Say like, look, you're throwing 83 objectively. If you want to have like, maybe you're a six foot righty, right? you're just a you're stock righty. You don't have anything particularly stand out in your arsenal pitchability. Like you're stock ready, you throw 83 currently 
these are the coaches that are even interested in you, right? You're talking like division three coaches are may be interested, but not really. But you look, if you, if you, you say you want to play it like Clemson or whatever, like here's what their staff looks like, right? 88 to 92 high pitch ability or 91, 94 with a little bit lower pitch ability, but a, you know, great fastball. You just, you make it as objective as possible. These are the metrics that you are realistically going to need to get to for you to play at the school that you want to play at. And even then it's not a guarantee. Oh, look, like you're six foot, 150 pounds. These guys that are all six foot throwing 93, they're 190 plus pounds. So we need to get there. Here's the plan to, here's the plan to do it. Here's what it's going to take. If you're running cross country, if you're playing basketball, like you can do that, but now you've just compressed your off season into like this, you know, January to February little block, or, you know, this July to August block, you've just compressed the amount of time you have to actually uh, make the requisite changes because guys don't honestly get better in season. You, yep. you improve like your pitch ability a little bit. You improve your, your comfort in, uh, you know, difficult game situations. You improve your baseball IQ in season, but you don't improve your, your body in season. Um, some slight exceptions to that. If you're a, never lifted a weight and you can still lift weights in season and get stronger if you're brand new to lifting. Sure. But by and large, the off season is when you're going to make 90 plus percent of those actual like physiological improvements to, to your athlete. So to me, that's like, those are the precious months. Like I always thought if I could just, just give me like two years of training, like don't compete at all, just two years. Like I could make four years of progress in two years. I can make five years of progress in two years because there aren't all these competition demands. So I don't want people to think that the tweet was saying like any, anything to support, like, like 10 you travel parents that want their kid doing showcases in December and like playing 150 games a year. Like I'm absolutely, that's one of the worst things you can do for development. Um, but that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be a focus year round for the mature high schooler who knows what they want. No, you're a hundred percent correct with that. And that's, that is, um, I love the way you put that, and I love the way you present those numbers to those athletes. And I've always found on my end that if I, I don't ever want to be the guy who puts my my philosophies or my thoughts out there before they start to have the conversation with me. I never wanted to be the guy who says, "Listen, I can see the writing on the wall. You're six foot something, and you play basketball, and you're not going to play in college, but you have a a chance to be really, really good at this sport over here as a pitcher. And you can do these types of things. And I can see it because I've coached athletes for, you know, 12 plus years now. And I, I know if you put this time in, but I never wanted to start that conversation. I wanted to be the guy. At that, the end of the day, it has to come from them, right? It can't yeah, come from the 100%. parents. It can't come from you. It has to come from them. And all you can do is be honest. Like, dude, you're just not good enough to play where you want to be, play. Or it maybe it's a stud athlete who is good enough to play. He's just like always been the best, best player. And he's like, well, I throw I already throw ninety two. Like, why should I not play? Why should I not be a, the star at all three sports? Like, why not? And like, that's a fair point. Like, if your goal sure. is to be the star playing three sports and just go play in college, like you're good enough, go do that. Um, and someone brought up like Jacob Degrom as an example. Like, pretty much any bigger you can think of was that guy because they're just such good athletes that look. The Degrom didn't have to go like research pitching for three hours a day for four straight years <laughs> because he was just so good. Like, he can do whatever he wants and he's still good enough, but. The counter example there is like DeGrom didn't start pitching till later on in his career and he's continued to improve every single year, partly because pitching was so new to him. Like, what if you took that, that track of like, you know, where he is at, well, however old he is now, like 27, but now he was that good at like 24 because he actually started focusing on pitching a little bit sooner, right? How good would he have been? It doesn't matter because he's still Jacob DeGrom, but you can, instead of making all this development once they actually get to college and suddenly they're actually prioritizing it, what if they had prioritized it two years earlier? How good would they be by the time they were a junior, right? Does that guy who's a 12th round pick become a fourth round pick because he's now a year or two further on in his development? Because he actually gained his strength base at age 17 instead of waiting till he was a junior in college to actually get that strength base, gain that velocity. Um, and so that would be my counter argument to like, well, every big leaguer played multiple sports. Like, yeah, but they were already super athletic by the time they got in high school because they played a bunch of sports when they were younger, which I completely agree with. Do you do you think they can do both? Do you think there's a there is a scenario where they can play basketball and train with tread, or is that just not feasible? Yes, yes it's just a it's it's definitely on a spectrum, right? So like on one end of the spectrum, like let's say it was just hey, I want to play pickup basketball once a week, right? That's not going to interfere whatsoever. But on the opposite end, it's like let's say it's seven days a week for some super competitive basketball team where I'm running 
uh, three hours a day, well, that's you literally aren't going to have time to train for baseball or you're barely going to have time to throw. What ends up happening is uh, these guys throw at like 9 p.m. They like end up sleep ends up becoming an issue. Uh, they end up not being able to get their calories in. Like they'll still weight train on the weekends, but like it's not optimal. They're not fully recovered. So there's a spectrum. It kind of depends on how competitive of a team you're uh, playing on and how much of a competing demand there is. Like running cross country was probably the absolute worst thing I could have possibly done because yeah. that's like a that's a direct competing demand. Uh, playing football is probably somewhere in the middle. It probably uh, isn't isn't as harmful to your development if you're getting in the weight room. You're still training hard, but but again, like if you go out, go have a concussion in your football season, like well that just set you back a month or three weeks or maybe longer. So you're just you're just kind of rolling the dice. And do you like what do you think is like when should they start specializing? Because I always like to point to the book. I don't know if you've read it, The Range by Epstein, where he actually goes down the route of um, talking about specialization and how early in life you don't want to specialize. You want to gather as much as you possibly can. Now, I don't think he was very specific on what age that was. Um, I always assumed that it would be around that 18 year old mark. What's, what's your thoughts on that? When should players start specializing in, okay. I, yeah, I think, I, throw, I think it has to be individualized. Uh, it has to be individualized. I think, I think it has to, like, I don't think there's a right answer here. Um, but after puberty, like at the, at the absolute earliest is like after they've gone through puberty. So the earliest I would say is like 15. Um, okay. By 18, you're already like in college. So somewhere between 15 and 18, um, would be the answer. And I think within that, it kind of depends on how developed are they? Like when they get into high school, like some, some guys, like, like I played with guys in college who had never touched a weight and they were like six, three, 210 pounds and like strong. And then I've played with guys who were me and they were like 150 pounds and like the amount of training time that is required to fill out a, like a ectomorphic frame is mm -hmm. a lot more than the guy who's just always like kind of that mesomorph, uh, has the strength base, super athletic, like doesn't have to work for it necessarily as much. So it's definitely individual specific. I would say the most important factor is having gone through puberty and it coming from the athlete, like them knowing beyond a, sh beyond a shadow of a doubt, that's what they want to focus on. Um, how much do you put into the idea of like the, the mental capacity side of things? Because obviously putting and devoting all your time to one sport it is a lot on and I mean I mean you yourself it sounds like you had no problem motivating yourself doing the day in day out grind you know searching for things finding result or finding information that's going to help your career how I mean not every athlete's like that like myself cause, so coming from my land I was a three sport athlete and I needed the jump to the next sport I needed the jump to the next sport I just happened to be better at baseball so I I wasn't fitting your your model of what you were talking about but I needed that break I needed to go play different sports and do that and then I once I got to college, I was mentally mature enough to actually take on one sport and go all in on it. How, how do you take that into accordance? It's the key. You, you talk about the mental maturity. Um, for whatever reason, I like something clicked when I was just before I was 16 years old. And like, I, I couldn't tell you why, but it clicked. And I was like, I suddenly had laser focus in what I was doing. And a lot of, a lot of athletes don't get that until they get to college and they like suddenly are forced into this, uh, this laser focus. Um, I don't think there's anything magically different about like being 17 and a senior in high school and being 18 and a freshman in college about like maturity level. Now you could argue like there's somewhere in that range where, where they don't have it. Um, so again, I, I don't have the exact answer. I don't think there's a exact uh, age range that you could, you could pinpoint. Um, but there is a, there is a maturity level at which they understand like the effort that's going to be required to get to where they want. They actually have, they have their own per, like true personal goals, not just like goals that somebody handed them and said like you have to play in college because like you're good, so you just have to. Like no, it's like actually coming from them. Like they don't just want to go and coast on their talent. They're like I'm going to do everything I possibly can. Whenever they get to that point, I don't know after puberty. Whenever they get to that point, yep, that would be my answer. And they you, might never get to that point. Have you noticed like from your clientele right now, the ones that play multiple sports? versus the ones that don't like they they go all in on all right i want to hit 95 by um freshman year of college what what has been the success rate in your experience now i go i know this is like it's hard to really like 
people who are listening don't take this as like gospel, but I just want to hear your experience with it because I think yeah. that would be very valuable to hear. So what, once guys go all in, it's like you just took the governor off of their development. They just their their development just takes off because they're finally actually focusing on on one thing. That's that's my experience by and large. The the guys who play multiple sports like they pretty much don't give themselves a baseball off season. They never develop. They just like go get on get by on talent for four or five six months of the year in season. Again, we talked about in season you're not developing, and then yeah. they fill up the entire rest of the year with other sports, which very minor carryover effects. Sure, there's some like aerobic capacity and some minor like explosiveness from playing basketball. Like sure, there's very some very minor carryover things at that point. Um, but they they're not really giving themselves a true off season where they can focus on development. Um, once they do, their de their development just takes off. So then so that there's plenty of guys at there's plenty of guys at the highest level who never had to. They were talented enough. Like when you're talking about natural athleticism, you're talking about like talent level, genetics, like that kind of like supersedes anything we're talking about here. If you have a Jacob Degrom example, like he can do whatever he wants. But what we're really talking about, we're talking to like the average high school, you know, sophomore who throws 82, who says he wants to play in college. That that's, There's way more of those than there are the Jacob DeGrom stud athletes. What do they 100%. need to do? Got to, you got to decide what you truly want. You got to be mature enough. You got to be willing to uh, objectively, like, lay out the, the numbers. Like, what mm -hmm. do I, realistically, what do I need to get to to hit the, these goals? And then you need to be able to be willing to make the sacrifice to get there. And to, to your previous point about you know, you know, I think you were kind of touching on like burnout. Like you just couldn't play one sport year round. Like you needed mm -hmm. the break. I'm not suggesting that we just like completely just obliterate high school athletes year round, right? Mm -hmm. This is the, what periodization is all about. It's like you have deloads throughout the, the year. You're focusing on maybe strength, certain parts of the year, explosiveness, other parts. You're shut down from throwing for two, three months of that. Uh, so you're giving the armor break. Uh, I'm not suggesting there aren't phases and waves of, of how you're loading the body and the arm and giving the, the mind a little bit of a break too, but that's all, that's still all factored in, right? Like doing everything you can to be a, the best pitcher doesn't mean throwing 365 days. Mm -hmm. It just means creating a plan that takes the entire year of development into account. Love it. So, so then on um, the California side of things, cause we hit on it a little bit early where California plays all year round. I'm out here right now. We're with our, I'm with our teams and they're saying like, yeah, we have a, we have a winter schedule. Then we have a spring and then we have a summer. And I'm like, Holy cow. When do you guys actually stop? And he's like, well, some of our, we, we will stop, but there are some players that will hop teams from team to team to team to team because it's a, it's a monthly dues. So they can do that. What's your recommendation for those warm weather cli uh, climates that do play year round and they are jumping from team to team to play every single weekend is that so it's it's the same problem ironically that's the same problem that the multi-sport athletes run into is they're never giving themselves an off season to develop the multi-sport athletes never give themselves an off season they never give themselves a you know august to january to actually get a little bit away from throwing uh build their bodies and the, the the guys who do play year round, they're never giving themselves that time either because they're just playing fall ball and now they're in winter showcases and now they're in preseason. And they, again, they don't give themselves that, that time. So it's counterproductive for a lot of high school athletes because one of the, one of the lowest hanging uh, pieces of fruit for development is strength training. Uh, and you're just not, you're not giving your, you need to give yourself, you know, months and months and months and months of time to do that, to actually make any measurable progress. So, uh, let's talk about like Rob Friedman's son, uh, pitching ninja son, Jack Friedman. Uh, he came to us at 135 pounds, like five foot eight, 15 years old. Um, we could have just like played you around or we could have made sure we had the off seasons to fully develop during those off seasons. Our goal was a pound to a pound and a half a week of weight gain. Obviously we were doing proper strength training and, and making sure that was good weight he was putting on, um, but because of that, because we wasted very little time throughout those those off season months, he gained seventy pounds over the next two years. So now he's a two hundred and five pound athlete. Now he's went from seventy six, seventy seven to ninety one, ninety two. By senior year, he was hitting ninety five. Um, 
does he do that if he's just constantly playing year round? Never actually takes a slight step back to actually build up, no. build his engine. Like I use the the race car analogy uh, in my in my book. It's like you actually need to take a step back and like upgrade your engine a little bit. You can't just keep racing your car until it breaks down. How long of a time frame? Your recommendation for like, all right, you have to take a break for this amount, and you are going to upgrade your engine. It's a little bit individual specific. Um, so let's say we have, let's say we're talking about like a high school senior who is throwing 81. He needs to throw 86 to play at the school he wants to play at. Like he's like up against the end of his career. He's got like five months realistically uh, to gain five miles an hour. Like he doesn't have any time to waste. You probably don't shut that guy down uh, nearly as long. You have to take a little bit higher risk with that guy uh, when you're looking at the risk reward of, of, shutting down from throwing that off season. So mm -hmm. there are various inflection points throughout one's career where like your career is going to be over. If you don't make this massive improvement, we go a little bit more aggressive with those guys. And we tell them like, look, you understand, like, we're not going to shut down as long. We're going to push it a little bit harder throwing and lifting from a lifting standpoint, because to give you any shot of making the progress we're trying to make in this short of a time frame, like you're going to have to roll the dice a little bit more than Let's say we're talking about a 15 year old. He's got four years to develop. He's already throwing 86. He's he's well on track for what he where he wants to play. You know we're probably going to be shutting down for 12 to 16 weeks from throwing, or from from high intensity throwing for that kid. So the range is anywhere from like four weeks away from high intensity throwing to upwards of 12 to 16 weeks away from high intensity throwing that we see. You're you're working yourself backwards basically and saying all right we're gonna work backwards we're gonna get you in yeah, the room it, at this it point it depends on what that in. uh it depends on the kid but m the more conservative uh situations it's 12 to 16 weeks uh and then the more uh, aggressive situations it's still going to be about four weeks away from high intensity throwing the the, the uh, average is probably in the four to eight week range in the in the last podcast we did we talked about virtual coaching and um i'm i'm very bullish on the future of where everything is going um ar vr i'm actually with one of our directors his wife is um in uh, the tech space and she was talking about that we had a huge conversation on it um give us a little deep dive on your virtual training you are you actually are probably one of the leaders i would assume yeah. in that space um starting very early i actually in 2012 i had an online coach when there was no thing as the online coach um, dive into your virtual training that you guys do um, and how you how you actually do it. Yeah, so we're uh, again we're talking about the one percent, right? The athletes who reach out to us are that one percent, or let's call it the top five percent. Like these are guys who uh, motivation is not the issue. They don't need someone there watching every rep, uh, you know, yelling at them to like not cut corners uh, when they're doing their work. Uh, they don't need the motivation or ha hand holding side. They're like, look. I'm going to put in the work. You just need to tell me what I need to get better at. What do I need to do? Like, is it a nutrition thing? Give me the nutrition plan. Tell me how to track my calories. Tell me what to follow. Is it a strength training thing? Like, tell me the exercises I need to do each day. What do I do when I get in the weight room? How many sets? How many reps? How do I do the form? What do I do from a throwing standpoint? What do I do from a mobility standpoint? What are my issues? Do I have any injury red flags? Uh, do I have any instabilities? Tell me what I need to do and lay it out and I will follow it. I just need to be able to ask questions when I have questions and have that open access to somebody to help guide me through this pro through this, this process. Uh, th that re really represents what most of our guys fit. Uh, it's, it's not that they need someone just watching them 20 hours a week. Um, and so again, remote training works perfect for that individual. Uh, because how do you, you can know, how do you know if that's the right fit though? Cause like, do you guys do like an interview process or like, because if you have a whole bunch yes. of dudes that come to you and then you're like, yeah, I'm sorry, man, you're not the guy you can't, you're, you're, it, I, I'm sorry to say it, you're not self-motivated and I don't know if you're going to do the, do the, do the stuff. Like, how do you actually, so the, the cool thing is that most of those guys don't reach out in the first place. If they're not self-motivated, they're not, um, you know, researching, pitching online and like discovering us and reading our stuff and following us and then reaching out and then, you know, paying our fees and, and even like, uh, pursuing that that conversation in the first place. Uh, but yeah, we do get on a phone call with every single athlete uh, and for high schoolers with their parents too, before we even accept them. Um, so you kind of weed out, like let's, I don't know how many high school players there are like 
400,000 high school players, right? Like we're talking about like a couple hundred, like two to 500 high school players that, that work with us somewhere, you know, it, it depends, but these are the most motivated of the motivated that, that take it upon themselves to reach out. Um, we like to say like every high school team has like that one kid who's kind of like a weirdo cause he's always doing his own routine and like right. has his own program. And like, yeah. everyone's like, like, why, why is that guy doing that? And like, so if they're like all these teams around the country, like have that one guy, like those are all our guys. Like, these, <laughs> these, are the, the, these are like the weirdos on the team that like, like think of like the Trevor Bauer who like, he's always had his own program and like could explain why he's doing it and what he's doing. And like, yeah. just wants to be the best version of himself he possibly could. Like, those are the guys we're going after. You know, we, we found like, again, we have a facility in Charlotte now. And so, um, you know, we do some of our assessments in house, but we found that we can get 99% of the same information uh, done remotely. So uh, just as an example for assessments, it's like, okay, there's about 35 different uh, positions and movements that we look at in our head to toe movement screen. So in, in person, we explain the movement, we have them do it in front of us. Online, they have a video that they watch explaining how to do the movement. They film the video themselves, they upload it into a Dropbox folder, they share that with us. And so we can still like, we can still use the, the protractor on the screen and measure the angle of hip internal and external rotation. Or we can still get the same measurements, we can still uh, give them pass fails uh, on every single movement screen assessment. Uh, we can still program their, their strength programming, we can still explain how to, uh, you know, track their macronutrients, micronutrients, um, you know, give them access to all the same information they need. Uh, we can still get video of all their throwing drills, uh, check in after each throwing session. Um, and so again, it's just a different model and it works really well for that, that one specific motivated athlete. Again, it's not going to work well for the guy who doesn't follow it. And do you think you can build that same type of a relationship, like, like virtually that you can do in person? Like, do you, do you guys value that as like with your staff, like really getting in with that athlete and. Hundred percent. Yeah, that? that's that's where most of our focus actually actually is. Is this the the ongoing relationship building and communication? Um, so, let's say we spend you know x number of minutes per per month actually like building out their their program. We're spending like ten x that amount of time actually talking with them, like hopping on Facetimes or Zooms, uh, texting them throughout the day, maybe a, a call a week. Um, but most of it's ongoing communication. Like they have the program, they understand what they need to follow, but really the, a lot of the value that's there is being able to ask questions. Like, hey, if something didn't quite feel right on this drill, or like I was feeling like I got a little bit around the, the breaking ball today. Okay, cool, man, send me a video. Like, let me see. Okay, yeah, you're you're getting a little bit uh, underneath that ball, or like you're you're you know a little too pronated on that pitch. Like, we can still have these same conversations. It's it's really being able to have somebody with you at any busy along the entire process who can be a problem solver. Like there were so many, there were so many points throughout my high school career where like, I was just beating my head into a wall cause I didn't know what to do. It's like, if I just had like a mentor who I could talk to and like, Hey, here's the issue I'm having. Like I'm feeling like stress on my back here. Oh yeah. That's cause you're actually not rotating from your hips you're rotating from your low back. Like if I had somebody to explain that to me and how to fix that, I would have saved myself like a four month, like back strain or like, um, you know, oh, okay, we're trying to gain weight. Well, you're actually not tracking your calories and you really need to be tracking those calories and not just like eating a lot of food. So here's how to track your calories. And I'm going to be checking your body weight chart every day and making sure that you're actually trending upwards. Okay. That would have saved me like three years of development. If I had someone to explain that process to me. That's huge. Where, where do you think pitching is going right now? I mean, it is, it is accelerated so fast from an information standpoint. Hitting is getting better it's still not there i think blast is doing some good stuff rap yep. is doing good stuff hit tracks um win reality um where do you think pitching is going to be going in the next three to five years so i think the last five years has really been about the the data and the technology um the technology has really advanced quite a bit and so now everybody has a rap soto or a track man you know everybody has an edutronic uh seemingly like we have a lot more uh, access to technology I think the next five years is going to be really understanding how to properly utilize and interpret this data and technology. Um, so right now it's, you know, right now it's highly valued. If you have somebody who can decode what all of this stuff means, that's why, uh, most MLB organizations are hiring like those, those young pitch design guys who can kind of like 
act as these these translators of this data and tech to like the older school pitching coaches who understand movement, understand the coaching side, but like they don't necessarily understand what the data and technology means. So I think that's the next frontier is not just dumping a bunch of uh, numbers on a player, but saying like, look, this is actually what it means um, and being able to decode when it matters and when it doesn't. Um, an example of this would be uh, through the analytics, like people realize that vertical break matters, right? Uh, high vertical break fastball uh, has higher whiff rates, uh, plays up, plays well up in the zone. Okay, like that's that's a pretty big breakthrough. It explains like why pitching down in the zone probably isn't the best case scenario for every athlete. But then you need to go a little bit deeper. It's like, okay, well, what about for a sinker guy? Well, sinker guys still do need to throw down in the zone because their pitch actually plays better uh, lower in the zone. But guys with high vertical break plays better up in the zone. Okay, so we need to understand like where these things diverge. Okay, what about training it? Like, let's say you have a guy with a average fastball. It's like 13 inches of vertical. Do you train him to get more sync and have a five inch vertical fastball, like a ton of sync? Or do you try to get him another five inches to 18 and get him to have a little bit of carry on that fastball? So that's, it's context specific. So, and then let's say you're trying to get him to carry it. Here's something we see all the time uh, in, in pro organizations with our guys is uh, their teams will say, we're going to try to uh, improve vertical break, but then they start altering their mechanics to cheat that metric. So they'll have a wrap soda or a track man and suddenly their elbow starts to climb up here and they start pushing the ball to try to just artificially create that backspin on the ball. Mm -hmm. And so then their velocity decreases, but the vertical break goes up and there's like this, this weird trade-off that happens. So we need to be able to know, like, look, it's not just as simple as this one metric is all that matters and like screw everything else. If we can zoom out and see, like, there's a lot of other interactions that are happening when we chase a certain, a certain pitch metric. So again, that's just one example of it. It seems like you guys, it seems like the baseball community is um, experimenting and researching and it seems like it's all being like our thoughts are, we're learning as we go. We're trying to yep. build the plane as we're trying to fly it. <laughs> which which is how it has to be, right? Like that's, yep. that's just how, that's how learning I would, happens. Um, I would rather have it that way than being closed source and people keep their research to themselves and there's no growth. Cause I'm sure that you're obviously learning from other people that are outside of tread and you're like, Oh, I never thought about that. Holy cow. For sure. And it's, it's tough for MLB MLB teams try to keep it in house, but it's tough because let's say they have a huge breakthrough with, you know, teaching a seam shifted wake slider. And so they teach all their pitchers how to throw it. That's a secret for about a month. Because then all these pitchers tell their buddies and, you know, now every, now that one gets traded to another organization, they teach everybody, right? Like it's really hard to keep big secrets within organizations. That stuff gets out because players talk, players go to get traded. Um, ultimately this, it, I prefer it to be open source and I prefer everybody to kind of have a, kind of have an even playing field, even playing field. And that's why we put out just about everything, you know, as we learn it, as we discover it online. Um, it's not about just hoarding that information. It's about sharing it and then getting feedback, uh, trying to get people to poke holes in, in what we're putting out. That helps us kind of refine what we're doing. Um, last last conversation I want to have is um, we have a mutual follow, which is Sahel Bloom. We've had him on the podcast. Okay. Um, awesome, awesome dude. Just awesome guy overall. Um, if you have if people who have not started following him, you need to. He has really good um, Twitter threads. But he came out and he said, what is the single worst piece of advice you've ever received? And then um, typically you, which is awesome to see, is that you said, be coachable. And um, I definitely agree with your take on it, uh, but explain because if you didn't scroll down to your next th uh, tweet, people kind of could take that the wrong way. Explain what you mean by be coachable. That's the worst piece of advice. Yeah, so a lot of... The, the default for like most high school athletes is like you're kind of trained throughout school, like from like your first instance of like being in the educational system to respect authority, to, you know, keep your mouth shut, listen to what, you know, do what you're told. Um, don't talk until you're called on. If the teacher says something like, and you disagree, like, you know, just don't vocalize that. Don't, don't be confrontational. Like you're, it's very much not an equal playing field. You're, you're less than you're the student. They're the teacher. Um, in sports, it's the same thing. It's they're the coach. You're the athlete. Don't question what the coach is saying. Um, if you disagree, well, 
you have to do it because I said so. Um, this is kind of the uh, the traditional relationship and hierarchy within like school, but also within athletics. And so athletes gets a high school, and it's even to professional baseball, even to college baseball, and they're they've been like molded to not question anything they're told. And this works in theory uh, if the coach has you know aligned interests, like they actually have your best interest at heart, and it's not just like mm -hmm. about abusing your arm to win games like if they actually have a line of interest and they actually know 100 percent of the time 100 percent of what they're doing which just no coach can say that i can't say that no, nobody with tread can say that like you don't always know the exact answer and if all the athlete does is just listen to you they're magically going to get to all of their dreams and goals it doesn't actually work that way so coaches are are using the knowledge they have they're using the context they're using what you hope are aligned incentives uh, which isn't always the case and they're, they're giving you information that they hope is going to help, but they don't know it's going to mm -hmm. help. They can't feel what you're feeling in your body. Um, they can't feel if something is, is truly a good or bad change. Like they'll have an idea, but if you go through your career, like I couldn't tell you how many coaches I've had dozens, hundreds, like how many different coaches have I come in contact with through little league, through high school? Uh, I mean, just in one year of spring training alone, there's like 10 different coaches telling me 10 different things. They all had their own take on like how I was throwing in a bullpen. And so yeah. like, what are you, what are you going to get if you actually listen to every single piece of advice and try to uh, enact that piece of advice from every coach you ever interact with, you're just going to be a complete head case. You're not, you can't just physically can't. So a lot of coach, the good coaches talk about becoming your own best coach. That's what good coaches talk about. And how do you become your own best coach? Well, it's really understanding why you're doing what you're doing. And once you start to have, build a framework of why you're doing what you're doing and you're not just like showing up to practice and like complete brain dead and like just doing stuff because coach says so once you start to th actually think critically and now you have this hierarchy this this uh this framework uh of like what works for you that framework should be solidifying over the course of your career at 15 you kind of understand your identity as a pitcher but not really by 18 you have a better understanding of like okay i'm a i'm a sinker guy like you know because of that like these are the things i need to do now a coach comes in and he totally just challenges everything that's ever worked for you. Should your first reaction be to like just not question it and just scrap everything? Should your first reaction be to like completely change your arm path, completely change your leg lift just because like your new college coach tells you to? Or should it be to actually say, wait a second, like that feels, that doesn't feel good. Like I've had success doing this and pursue a real conversation with that coach. Now, Coach, a lot of coaches will say like that, that athlete's not coachable. Like he's a problem athlete. Like he's questioning what I'm saying. When in reality, no, he's actually looking out for his career because it's his career. It's not the coach's career. So there's a tactful way to do it. There's a tactful way to be your own best coach. There's a tactful way to have disagreements. And I think you can place blame on either side. Like there are definitely athletes that are just stubborn a-holes and like mm -hmm. the coach is giving <laughs> legitimate advice and has, will actually give a real reason and the athlete just doesn't want to hear it or even have a conversation. And then there's coaches on the flip side who they have their own ego problem. And there's an athlete with a legitimate point. And he's been doing something. Let's say it's a high draft pick professional pitcher. And he's had success his first year. And he comes to spring training and they want to totally scrap his arm action. Well, he probably has a legitimate point. Like, wait a second. Like, why are we doing this? So the coach also needs to be able to check his ego at the door and have that conversation and admit that he's not necessarily going to be right every every step of the way either. So the coachable athlete, to me, is the athlete that doesn't question himself. He doesn't uh, have enough confidence in his routine. He doesn't have enough understanding in why he's doing what he's doing. If he's just uh, placing 100% of the faith in his coach to develop him. You're in charge of your own career. You're in charge of developing yourself. And the coach is just there as a sounding board to help give you ideas, give you a little bit of structure. Um, so that's kind of how I look at that that relationship. It's more of like an even playing field relationship and a collaborative relationship with with your coaches. Um, like one example, like I had a really good pitching coach my first two years of college. But like if I was if I was one hundred percent reliant on him, then what happens when he leaves for another school and I get a brand new pitching coach for my next two years? Like you can't be 100% reliant on your pitching coach. You have to understand internally so that when that guy leaves and now you're, you know, go from low A to high A to double A, you're going to have different pitching coaches. So that's that's really all I was getting at there. Well, that's the difference between the most coachable athletes I've been around that don't 
un they're just like brain dead. They don't actually understand what they're doing. Well, that's the difference between developing players and developing people. If you develop people the right way, they should be able to think critically and start trying to learn the material. If they really want to chase a dream, they have to dive deep into the weeds, just like you did on um, the the pitching stuff back in the day. And I, it, it's more that it's easier now than it ever has been, where I can just go on Twitter, follow Tread, or um, follow Drive, or wh whoever, wh whatever thoughts that I want to get into inside my feed. Even having contradicting thoughts to, to kind of second guess it and make sure that I'm I'm on the track. It, it, that's the best way to actually learn. Yeah. And, and, um, and a, a good coach will get a good coach will welcome that conversation, right? A good coach yeah. will welcome a player who. Uh, questions them in a respectful way and brings ideas to the table and a, a coach with an ego problem will be threatened by that he'll say like how dare you suggest that you should be doing something different than the rest of the team like that's gonna you know threaten the team's well-being because like you're off here doing your own thing and everyone else is doing my thing like so again it, sometimes you can place the blame on I, i've definitely seen some players where it's it's on them and i've seen coaches where it's on them um, and again i'm just trying to kind of be the bridge here because i'm you know I've been in the playing world. I've been in the coaching world. Yeah. It's the difference between a dictatorship and someone that actually wants to win, win, like win big time, 100 to zero. That's what exactly. it is. Yep. So Ben, this has been an unbelievable conversation. I, I appreciate you coming on, um, talking about specialization. I think it was a, a very constructive conversation. I think a lot of people are going to get a lot of good takeaways um, from this. Uh, go ahead and plug in um, your, Twitter handle. I'll, I'll include this into the show notes. Also, if you are in St. Louis, um, he will be coming in town um, in January um, for the World Pitching Conference, right? Congress. Uh, World Pitching Congress. Congress. Yeah. Sorry. Yep. Um, and which will be um, actually right next to our facility um, if you guys want to um, find tickets for that. So um, go ahead and plug in your stuff. Yeah, so you can find us uh, on Twitter at Tread Athletics, Instagram, uh, Tread underscore Athletics. Uh, and again, those are just kind of like little snippet pieces of content uh, throughout the week, a couple a couple tweets or whatever a day. Uh, if you guys want to see our long form content, uh, really deep dive videos on various topics, uh, find us on YouTube uh, at Tread Athletics. Uh, that's where we'll, we'll really dive into the weeds, uh, answer Q and A's. Uh, and then if it's something specific to, you know, to whoever's watching or, or their son, uh, shoot us an email, contact at tradeathletics.com. Again, no pressure, no obligations. Or just shoot us an email. What are you struggling with? Uh, we'll have a conversation. We'll uh, give you an email response and try to point you in the right direction. Perfect. Well, um, Ben, thanks again. Dave, you have anything to no. um, send us off on? No, just really appreciate the conversation. Lots of good information here. Um, love the way you just, uh, you know, picked apart why you said the, you know, what you said and I really agreed with it and just really, again, I appreciate the, uh, the knowledge and everything you shared today. All right. Appreciate it guys. Thanks Spiker. Thanks David. Thanks.